Uh, yeah, thanks. So it's about bootstrapping M theory, uh, string theory, it's based on these uh, recent papers. Um, so a natural question is, what is string theory non-perturbatively? So usually when we learn about string theory, we define it via the world sheet, which is an inherently perturbative definition. So in particular, you can use the world sheet um, to compute the flat space string S matrix in a small string coupling expansion uh, for finite string length, i.e. alpha prime. Uh, so this is inherently perturbative. Um, so a natural question is, how do we understand string theory for finite string coupling and string length, non-perturbatively? Um, furthermore, um, usually, in most cases, we only know how to study string theory in flat spaces. Now, there's some exceptions, but that's for the most part the case. And so we'd like to also understand how to study string theory at finite curvature and Ramon-Ramon flux, which corresponds to most realistic compactifications. So um, there's been some progress in this direction using uh, the Green-Schwartz approach to the superstring, as well as the pure spinner approach. But I would say that to this day, there's still no systematic way of understanding string theory at finite curvature. So the goal is we want to understand string theory at finite curvature and at finite string coupling in order to understand string theory non-perturbatively which I think would answer the question of what is string theory. So you might say that the answer is from holography. Um, so as everyone in this room probably knows, um, you can define string theory when it's asymptotically anti de Sitter non-perturbatively via ADS CFT. So in the classic example, you have type 2B string theory and ADS 5 crosses 5 with string length uh, and complex string coupling tau. And this is dual to a CFT in four dimensions with n colors what we call n equals 4 super mills where the complexified gauge coupling is uh, simply identified with the complexified string coupling. And then uh, N in Yang mills is related to the ADS radius L and uh, the string length by this classic dictionary. Um, and so one thing we can immediately see from this dictionary is that when N is very big, the string length is small, which means that we then have a good low energy description from ADS 5 crosses 5 supergravity. Um, and so, in particular, that means we can use ADS5 crosses 5 supergravity, which we understand, um, to study CFT quantities to leading order in the large N expansion, or the, the, the subleading correction. So, for instance, you know, one such calculation is that you could compute a scaling dimension of this double trace operator, uh, the first one of our N correction, you know, as was done back in the 90s. Um, but holography is not a complete answer, because it only gives us the dictionary, and it doesn't actually tell us um, what the CFT is. So it's translated perhaps the very hard problem of quantum gravity to just the slightly less hard problem of CFT. But CFT is still a hard problem. It is strongly coupled, and we don't actually know how to compute things at finite end and coupling in the CFT. So I would say that the only way we can actually say that we have solved string theory non-perturbatively, even in the case of ADS, is if we have methods to solve the corresponding CFT non-perturbatively. Only then can we say we understand string theory non-perturbatively. Um, so, what do people understand so far about these holographic CFTs? So, uh, one simple limit is weak coupling. So, when the coupling of the gauge theory is small, then you can study n equals 4 super mills using Feynman diagrams as you would any other weakly coupled gauge theory. Um, so, for instance, um, to take another observable that's been computed in this limit, um, you have the single trace Konishi operator, which in the free theory has dimension two, and then you could compute as many loops as you want. In particular, people have one up to four loops. Um, and there's kind of this curious pattern where you only start seeing non-planar corrections at four loops, which is this one over n squared term. So you could do whatever you want in the weak coupling limit, but if you care about gravity, the weak coupling limit isn't so interesting because according to the ADS CFT dictionary, this weak coupling limit is dual to the very stringy regime. So this is very far away from supergravity. It's very far away from any geometric understanding of string theory. So you're not learning too much about what you would actually want to learn about quantum gravity uh, using weak coupling in the gauge theory. Um, an alternative uh, perturbative expansion, which is a bit more interesting, is planar integrability. Um, so using integrability, you can compute everything about the CFT in the strict planar limit when n goes to infinity. And you could do this at finite lambda, where recall that lambda is uh, the tough coupling uh, GA mil squared net. And so this uses something called the quantum spectral curve, which um, although it was developed, you know, 10 years ago, it was only actually implemented in practice numerically um, in the last uh, year or so. Um, and so using this integrability approach, um, first of all, you can verify the weak coupling results because you can do leading order large n small lambda. And so then you can recover that formula from a couple slides ago um, to, you know, as many orders as you want in lambda. Uh, but more interestingly for gravity people, 
is that you can also look at large lambda, and then you can see what happens to single trace operators like the Konishi at very large lambda. So as you see, um, they go off to infinity with this positive power lambda to the quarter. So in particular, these terms here, or certainly the first term, was actually originally predicted from string theory um, using holography. Uh, the fact that you get lambda to the quarter basically falls from the fact that this is a massive stringy state, which is proportional to string tension. Uh, so this was a prediction, uh, and then it was matched from a purely gauge theory calculation using integrability. So this was like a nice check of ADCFT, um, you know, back in the day. So integrability is a very powerful and wonderful story, but its limitation is that it's really only in the planar limit, leading order large n. And so from the bulk perspective, integrability is telling you how to solve classical string theory, but it's not telling you anything about quantum string theory. Um, so an example of that limitation is that if you look at higher trace operators, then in this planar limit, they just trivially uh, reduce to the products of the component single traces. So for instance, imagine we wanted to look at this double trace operator, which we discussed a few slides ago. Um, so we can't even compute the leading one over n correction. So we don't even have access to what we know from supergravity because we just don't know that in the strict planar limit. So instead, we just have two plus two equals four. You know, not that interesting. Um, another limitation of planar integrability can be seen from the spectrum from integrability. So in this plot, um, the uh, x-axis is the Tuft coupling, the y-axis is scaling dimensions of various unprotected singlet operators as computed from integrability. And so recall that higher trace operators are literally just adding together single trace operators. So the lowest dimension operator at weak coupling is the Konishi, as you would expect, but then the Konishi goes off to infinity, and so instead, for some value of coupling, the lowest dimension operator starts becoming this double trace, which is just dimension four in this planar limit. So it's just this horizontal line. Um, so one um, unphysical thing you see from this plot is level crossing. Um, so one thing we know about quantum mechanics, going all the way back to Wigner and, and von Neumann, is that whenever you're computing physical observables in quantum mechanics, which are eigenvalues of some Hermitian matrix, as a function of some adiabatic parameter, it cannot be the case that these eigenvalues can cross as a function of that adiabatic parameter. They always have to repel. And this is, should also be true in quantum field theory. And so we see that this is violated in this integrability spectrum, and this is because we're taking the strict large n limits, so it's not really like a proper quantum field theory. Um, and so if we are really to understand this um, gauge theory non-perturbatively, we should see level repulsion, which is what you expect of an actual you know, quantum mechanical theory. Um, so in today's talk, I'm gonna go beyond these perturbative methods of weak coupling and integrability, and instead, I'm gonna tell you how to non-perturbatively solve n equals 4 C Bragg mills for every value of n and for every value of the coupling. Um, thereby giving a non-perturbative solution to string theory, at least in asymptotic ADS. Um, so the outline is, first we're gonna discuss the quantity we're gonna be computing, um, which is the stress tensor correlator. Uh, then we're gonna discuss non-perturbative constraints and how to implement them at both large or finite n. Um, then we're gonna discuss uh, numerical bootstrap bounds, uh, which we will compare to both weak and strong coupling perturbative analytic results as a check of our non-perturbative solution. And then finally, we're gonna discuss new physical things you can learn from having this non-perturbative solution. Uh, so improvements, uh, for instance, to the planar integrability spec. Um, okay, so let's begin with some basics about n equals four super Young mills. So all n equals four conformal field theories, um, more general than the super Young mills, have an SU4 R symmetry and are conformal manifolds with one complex parameter tau. This is just a kinematic fact. Um, and so we can label them by the value of their central charge, which for super Young mills would be the dimension of the gauge group divided by four, as well as the value of this complex parameter tau. So the specific n equals four CFT we care about is super Young mills. This is a gauge theory where the matter transforms in the adjoint of the gauge group G, which must be a compact classical Lie group. And so for this talk, we're gonna take the case where the group is SUN, such that C is proportional to N squared, but we could really do any other gauge group. This is just for simplicity. Um, so because this is a conformal manifold, that means there should be some duality group which relates different C of T's in this conformal manifold. So the duality group in this case is SL2Z, um, and there's two special points along this conformal manifold. One of them is where tau equals I. In that case, there is an enhanced Z2 global symmetry, Another case is tau equals e to the i over three, in which case there's an enhanced Z3 symmetry. And so we're gonna see, once we have this non-perturbative solution, how these two special points uh, are notable. Okay, so the specific observable we're computing is um, perhaps the simplest non-trivially observable in n equals four, which is the stress sensor four-point function. 
So some brief kinematic facts about this correlation function is that instead of considering literally the stress tensor, we can consider the superprimary, which is the scalar s in the 20 prime of the R symmetry. And then we can use uh, the various constraints of supersymmetry and conformal symmetry to simplify the four-point function. So what it boils down to is that the four-point function is written in terms of this function t of u and v. And so all the non-trivial information in this four-point function is written in terms of this t and u and v, where u and v are functions of the four positions, uh, what are called conformal cross ratios. And so this t is an R symmetry singlet. And so the goal of this talk is to study t of u and v. That will give us the four-point function. Um, and so by studying t of u and v, we've already satisfied all the kinematic constraints of uh, supersymmetry. Um, so now, as in any four-point function in a CFT, we can take the OPE twice in order to expand it in conformal blocks. Um, so here's the conformal block expansion of the four-point function. It's written in terms of T. So um, there's two kinds of multiplets that appear. We have short multiplets, which are completely trivial in the sense that their scaling dimensions are fixed, and even their OPE coefficients are also fixed in terms of this central charge C. Um, so they're just linear in terms of 1 over C. And so we can just sum them up into some exact function once and for all, and we never have to think about them again. Um, all the non-trivial information is the long multiplets, which is what we show in this sum here. And so both the scaling dimensions, delta, as well as the OP coefficients, lambda, are unknowns. So this is where all the dynamical information in the four-point function hides. So if you want to study the four-point function, your goal is to compute the scaling dimensions and OP coefficients of these long multiplets, which for this four-point function are all singlets of the R symmetry. And so that's going to be the goal of today's talk, is to compute the CFT data, delta, and lambda. OK, so how are we going to go about computing this non-perturbatively? Um, so let's review the non-perturbative constraints that we have access to. Um, so first of all, we have crossing symmetry. And this is just the fact that in Euclidean CFT, you can rearrange these operators, and it shouldn't matter. So first of all, let's impose this in a large n expansion. So we learned how to do this um, from the classic paper of HPPS. I guess, done here in Santa Barbara uh, 15 years ago. Um, and so what this paper taught us, as well as various follow-ups, is that when you expand the four-point function in large n, or alternatively large c, it turns out that crossing symmetry, as well as some other analyticity constraints, severely constrains the four-point function at every order in 1 over n. So for instance, at leading order in 1 over n, it's totally fixed. At subleading order, it's fixed in terms of one coefficient, which is just some number. At sub-subleading order, it's again fixed in terms of one coefficient. The next order, there's two coefficients, et cetera. And so this means that all the functional dependence, all the dependence on positions, u and v, is fixed. And all you have to do is fix these numbers b, which get more and more at every order in 1 over n, in order to solve the theory. So what are these labels I'm giving these functions? Well, this tells you the bulk interpretation. So the leading 1 over n term is coming from a tree-level graviton exchange. That's what this r denotes. Um, but then, because gravity is a non-normalizable theory, you have infinite higher derivative corrections. Um, so this is the first high derivative correction, r to the 4. This is some one-loop term with a, a certain contact term you have to fix. This is the next high derivative correction, et cetera. And so the 1 over n expansion includes higher derivative corrections as well as higher loop corrections. Um, and in every order, you just have to fix a few coefficients. So that's how crossing constrains the large n expansion analytically. At finite n, instead, the way we consider crossing is that we consider our block expansion, and we demand that the block expansion in one channel should be related to the block expansion where we permute, say, x1 and x3. And so this leads to this crossing equation written here in terms of our unknowns, which are the OP coefficients as well as the deltas. And so um, this is a much more complicated constraint. So at large n, we could solve crossing analytically. At finite n, we don't know how to solve this analytically. Instead, this is a very complicated equation. It's called the crossing equation. And this is the source of the conformal bootstrap. So this is a function's worth of uh, uh, equations, because you have this equation for every value of u and v. Um, OK, that's the first non-perturbative constraint. The second non-perturbative constraint is unitarity. So unitarity, in the context of the block expansion, says that the OP coefficients squared have to be positive, and the scaling dimensions have to be bigger than spin plus 2. So one very important conceptual point is that in the context of this four-point function, at large n, unitarity is trivial. And the reason why it's trivial is that the leading large n term is this generalized free field theory, which satisfies unitarity basically by construction. All the OP coefficients are known. They're positive numbers. And so because you've already satisfied unitarity at leading order, uh, that means you cannot possibly have any constraints at subleading order. And so this is the problem with the analytic large n bootstrap. 
And this is why the analytic large end bootstrap is infinitely weaker than the finite end bootstrap, because you don't have the constraints of positivity. You're not using unitarity. Um, for the finite end bootstrap, in contrast, um, you can non-trivially impose that the OP coefficient squared are positive. And as a result, that means that you can now think of this equation as an infinite sum of vectors, which are these f's times positive numbers, which are the lambda squareds, must equal zero. And so you can think of this as some linear algebra problem. Um, it's an infinite problem. You have to do some kind of truncation. After truncating it, you basically have some finite list of constraints. And then you can use the numerical bootstrap algorithm, which I won't go into detail, to then compute bounds on the CFT data that's showing up in this uh, set of linear constraints. So the only detail about this algorithm you should know is that um, the bounds get better and better as you increase your truncation size of the infinite set of equations. So the full crossing equations you have for every value of u and v. Um, but in order to implement this in practice on a computer, you have to sample a finite set of this infinite vector space of u and v. In practice, we do basically a Taylor expansion in u and v. And so we are going to parameterize that finite set by this capital lambda. And so as lambda gets bigger, the bounds monotonically improve. And this is the sense in which bootstrap bounds are rigorous. So they don't oscillate, they just always get better. Um, and so another conceptual point I want to emphasize is that the numerical bootstrap bounds coming from this finite end bootstrap can be more constraining than the analytic bootstrap, even when you're looking at large values of n. Because as long as n is not strictly infinite, you still have the constraints of unitarity. Um, and that's why finite end numerical bootstrap is infinitely more powerful than uh, what Polchinski did here in Santa Barbara 15 years ago. Um, okay. So the last non-perturbative constraint we're going to consider is supersymmetric localization. Um, so first of all, um, kinematically, you can show that if you have the sphere-free energy deformed by a mass, which couples to the hypermultiplet, then by taking derivatives of this mass and setting the mass to zero, you get an integral of the four-point function over the sphere. Why is that? That's because the mass couples to the stress tensor multiplet, and so it acts as a source. And so all you're doing is taking derivatives of a source, and that gives you integrals of the operator that couples to that source. And so there's two such integrated constraints you can consider. This is an exact non-perturbative equation. Um, and you'll see why it's useful, because as I'll show you in the next slide, we know how to compute the left-hand side non-perturbative. But before we talk about the left-hand side, these are just two new constraints. And so we can apply them at large n to fix two of those unknown coefficients b at every order in 1 over n. Um, alternatively, we could apply it at finite n just to add two additional constraints to our infinite set of linear constraints. So we have infinite linear constraints from crossing, and then we'll have two more constraints from these two localization integrated constraints. Um, okay, so how do we compute the left-hand side? Um, so it was taught to us by Pestoon back in 2008 that you can simplify the free energy, which naively is some infinite dimensional path integral, in terms of a rank G dimensional matrix model integral where uh, G is the dimension of the gauge group. Uh, so in particular, for G equals SUN, the explicit formula you have for the massive form partition function is as follows. So as you see, it's N minus 1 integrals for the number of cartans. Uh, then you have some classical term, you have some one loop term, and then you have a term which takes into account instantons. So all the theta dependences in the instantons, everything else only depends on G ang mills via this classical term. Um, so uh, for small values of N, you can just do these integrals numerically. So you take four derivatives of mass, set mass to zero, and just do a numerical integral, and th that's fine. Um, but eventually, um, as you know, students of quantum gravity, we want to understand large n. And so once n's getting to be 10 or 20, of course, we can't do 19 integrals. Um, and so that's why we want to have some kind of nice computable formula for any value of n. And that's what I'm going to des describe in the next few slides. So first of all, why is this calculation possible? The reason why it's possible is that when the mass is zero, actually, the matrix model becomes trivial. It's just a free Gaussian matrix model. And so this means that, in principle, taking derivatives of mass and setting mass to zero means you're just computing expectation values of some operator in a free theory. And so there should be some way this should be possible, even though the operator itself might be super complicated. So if you ignore the instantons, then the operator is actually simple enough that you can actually do the calculation exactly using this method of orthogonal polynomials. Um, and so this is what I did in my paper from uh, five years ago. And so this is the answer you get, for instance, for the two-mass derivative case. So for the two-mass derivative case, um, you've simplified n minus 1 integrals into just one integral. So there's just a single integral over this auxiliary variable. Um, and the integrand depends on these Laguerre polynomials with some sum over n. 
Um, similarly, the four mass derivative case uh, for any value of n can be written in terms of two auxiliary integrals. So if we didn't have the instantons, the answer would just be these exact analytic formulas. Um, but we do have instantons. Um, luckily enough, though, we know what the integrand is for the instantons, because this was taught to us by Nekrasov. So in particular, you can think of this instanton contribution. Um, you can write it in terms of every instanton sector, which is labeled by k, um, where the meaningfulness of k is that it comes with this e to the 2 pi i k tau factor. And then these zk's are known functions. So first of all, at large n, using the explicit expressions of these functions in these papers, we showed how to compute these mass derivatives uh, to any order in 1 over n. So for instance, for the two mass derivative case, um, here's the first few terms. They're all written in terms of these non-holomorphic Eisenstein series, um, which takes into account all infinite instanton contributions. Uh, we know it to all orders. They're all Eisensteins. Um, similarly, for the four mass derivative case, um, you can also expand it in terms of non-holomorphic Eisensteins, as well as some other modular invariant, which we call a generalized Eisenstein series. Um, these uh, modular invariants, the reason why you have them is because this observable is an SL2Z invariant under the duality. So that's why you expect, you know, these kinds of functions, although it could have been another modular invariant function. You know, it wasn't obvious that it would be these non-holomorphic Eisensteins. Um, okay, so we have this analytic expansion to any order in 1 over n, um, but we certainly don't have an analytic answer for finite n for these instantons, because that would be super, super complicated. Um, now, I actually should comment that for one of these mass derivatives, in fact, Michael Green, Daniel Dirogoni, and Kang Kao Wen did actually find an exact analytic formula. Um, but for the four mass derivative case, we were not able to find it. Um, instead, though, we're going to use a trick in order to get the answer in practice for any value of n in tau. And so uh, here's the trick. Um, so first of all, let's look at what these Eisenstein series look like explicitly. So they have two non-instanton terms, and then they have infinite instanton terms. And so clearly, you can't use these holomorphic Eisensteins to approximate weak coupling, because a weak coupling, GA Mills is going to zero, and these non einstein terms would clearly diverge. And so that means clearly this large n finite tau expansion can't work um, in the weak coupling regime, because these terms are just going to be diverging. On the other hand, though, if you look at these instanton terms, they depend on GA Mills via this Bessel function, and this thing converges exponentially fast. And so if you're only looking within the fundamental domain of vessel 2 z then all these instanton terms are super well converged. So it seems like the problem is the perturbative terms, the instanton terms are great. And so what we do in practice then is for the non-instanton terms, we just use this exact expression, which we computed using orthogonal polynomials. And then for the instanton terms, we just only look at the instanton part of the large n expansion. And so by combining both, this ends up giving an extremely accurate uh, expression for every single value of n and coupling within the fundamental domain. Um, and so to demonstrate this fact, here on these plots, I compare an exact evaluation of these mass derivatives, say for n equals 2, uh, which would be like the case where this approximation would be the absolute worst. And I compare this to this um, combined large n, finite n from the previous slide. And as you see, it's extremely accurate. So here, this is going all the way from the free theory to the strong coupling point, tau equals i. They're basically indistinguishable. Here, the y-axis is way more zoomed in. Nonetheless, still, they're basically indistinguishable. And so hopefully this should convince you that we have a practical approach of computing this localization input for any value of n and tau. Um, and so this is one of the main progresses um, relative to our numerical bootstrap paper from two years ago. Uh, OK. Um, so now let's combine all our non-perturbative constraints in order to solve the theory. Um, so in particular, we're combining unitarity, crossing symmetry, and localization. And so it was shown how to do this in practice in the paper from a couple years ago. So in particular, n is inputted via the value of c, which showed up in those short contributions. Tau, which is a single complex parameter, is put in by the two localization inputs. And so that's why the localization inputs are so important, because without them, we wouldn't know how to put in tau. Um, um, and then finally, we impose both the crossing symmetry as well as the localization inputs as linear constraints. We have infinitely many of them. And the bounds would prove monotonically with the truncation size parameterized by this capital lambda. So in the 2021 paper, we could only do this algorithm for low values of n. Because back then, we just had to do the n minus 1 integrals by brute force. So the novelty of the new paper from a few months ago is that now we figured out how to do the localization inputs for any value of n. And so now we can really study the theory for any n and for any coupling. OK, so now let's just show the results from this algorithm. So first, here are some plots from the paper from a couple years ago. So this is for a low value of n, n equals 2. And on the x-axis of these plots, we have the coupling. Uh, the theta dependence is very weak in this plot, so we don't really show it. 
And on the y-axis, we have the lowest dimension unprotected operator. So at weak coupling, this is what we would call the Konishi. Um, and so the nice thing about these plots is that, first of all, within the weak coupling regime, we can compare to these analytic weak coupling predictions. And as you see, they saturate the upper bound very precisely for an enormous range. I mean, naively, you would have thought this is an asymptotic expansion. It would only work over here. In fact, it works all the way up until over there. Um, and so this gives us you know, some pretty good confidence that, in fact, this upper bound is corresponding to the physical theory. And after all, oftentimes in the bootstrap, uh, physical theories show up right on the boundary. That was the case in the icing model, for instance. Um, on the right-hand plot, we focus on the regime going from tau equals i to tau to e to the i pi over 3. And this kind of demonstrates that this value of e to the i pi over 3, which is the special z3 point, seems to be the maximum for the slowest dimension operator. Um, another thing we learned from this plot is that you can compare this improved bootstrap bound to the older bootstrap bound by Rosselli et al. from 10 years ago, which did not use localization. So that's just a horizontal line, because it does not depend on the coupling. And notice that the improved bound never coincides with the old bound for any value of the coupling. So, you know, you, you know, I think some people thought maybe 10 years ago that perhaps these old bounds, you know, for some special value of tau were corresponding to super Yang mills. Now we know that they do not. And so you could ask, well, okay, so what is corresponding to this old bound? Um, and so I had a paper with Fernando Alde from last year where we showed some evidence that there's this exotic pure ADS5 supergravity theory, which is basically um, um, ADS5, except with no KK modes, except for the graviton. And we showed some evidence that that is probably what is saturating this bound. But I won't discuss that more, because it's not the main subject of the talk. Um, we can similarly compute bounds on the OP coefficient of this Konishi operator. This bound is a bit more non-trivial. As you see, it goes down, and then it goes up. Um, this bound uh, is a little bit less converged. Nonetheless, there's a pretty decent match with weak coupling in the weak coupling regime. OK, so now let's go to the plots from the new paper, though plots that we can do for arbitrary n instead of just doing for n equals 2. So in this plot, the x-axis is the tuft coupling, um, ga mil squared n, and the y-axis, as usual, is just the lowest dimension operator. And so these different colored lines correspond to different values of n. So we start from low n down here, and we go up to large n. And the dotted line was the prediction from integrability from, from the fifth slide of this talk. So you might remember from that earlier slide that the integrability curve starts like the Konishi, but then becomes flat once you hit 4, because it, come, it becomes the double trace. And so as you see, our non-perturbative bound, which we think corresponds to super n equals 4 super mills, is gradually approximating this exact value, which is known at infinite n, as n gets bigger and bigger. And so this is kind of a nice consistency check, and it shows how we're recovering these integrability results from our non-perturbative solution. And so one could imagine that as n would go to a huge number, we would just kind of exactly um, start matching this bound. Um, OK. Um, we can also do this for the OP coefficient. In this case, there's actually no integrability result to compare to, because integrability has not been able to compute OP coefficients yet, although in principle they should be able to. Um, but when they do, we will have this prediction to compare to. Um, here, n starts on top, and it gets smaller and smaller. And so you can imagine as n's going to infinity, this thing would maybe become flat, and then like jump up, and then go like that. Um, Okay, so let's take a slight detour to go back to the large n expansion. So um, recall that in the large n expansion, as Polchinski taught us, we could fix terms at every order in 1 over n in terms of a few coefficients, b's, and then we could compute these coefficients b using the localization inputs. We can compute two b's at every order in 1 over n. These b's are functions of tau. And so because the localization inputs are written in terms of Eisenstein's, as a result, the b's are written in terms of Eisenstein's, and we have various consistency checks. And so at the end of the day, we can extract CFD data from this correlation function in this strong coupling limit. So this is the opposite limit of weak coupling. This is large n finite tau, very strong coupling. So for instance, the lowest dimension operator we can extract is this double trace operator. It starts at dimension 4. The first correction is just 1 over n. This is what was computed by Rustelli et al. 15 years ago. Uh, but then the next few corrections depend on tau. And these are stringy corrections. So this is the correction corresponding to the r to the 4, higher derivative term. This is the one-loop term. This is d to the 4, r to the 4. And we can actually compute a few more. Um, and so this is the formula we're now going to use to compare to our non-perturbative results at strong coupling. OK, so now let's look at a value of n big enough such that we can compare to this large n strong coupling regime. So here, n equals 10. Um, and um, we go all the way from the free theory to the strong coupling value, tau equals i. 
So just as in the n equals 2 plots, you still see that in the weak coupling regime, this analytic weak coupling prediction is saturating the bound. But now we can also compare it to this brown dotted line, or purple, um, which is the strong coupling result. And the strong coupling result also saturates the bound in the strong coupling regime. And so we now have even more evidence that our non-perturbative solution really is corresponding to n equals 4 superior modes. Because we can compare it to both weak coupling and strong coupling predictions, and in both cases they saturate. Um, another uh, physics thing we can learn from this is that we can see how, we, how level repulsion is starting to emerge. Because here on the left, we have a single trace operator. On the right, we have a double trace operator. With integrability, these two things would just meet at a point, um, you know, which violates quantum mechanics. Uh, but now that we have a finite end solution, we see that they are repulsing. And that's basically what's happening over here as the non-perturbative solution interpolates from the double trace operator to the single trace operator. Now, of course, it would be even nicer if we could see the next few lowest operators. Uh, but, but that is for a uh, future talk. Uh, for now, we're just focusing on the lowest dimension operator. But the nice thing is that we can really see the non-perturbative interpolation. So it's really this region right here where we really needed finite end, because you would not be able to see that from either weak coupling or strong coupling. Um, here are similar plots for other large values of n, just to convince you this wasn't a coincidence for n equals 10. Um, and then you can make a similar plot uh, for the OP coefficient. This plot is even more striking. So again, you see a match to weak coupling and a match to strong coupling, uh, which is somewhat more non-trivial. Um, the fact that there's these various lines, this, we had to do some kind of extrapolation uh, because convergence was a bit slower. Um, and so in this plot, you see that in the weak coupling regime, where it's approximated by a single trace operator, it's all the way down here, and then the level repulsion is really strong. So like, it non-perturbatively shoots all the way up in order to start matching with the double trace operator, which is significantly bigger. And so you really see the non-perturbative effects much stronger in this OP coefficient than you did in uh, the scaling dimension, uh, you know, which I think is fun. Um, OK, and here are similar plots for other large values of it. OK, this is just some comment about this extrapolation we did, just to convince you we weren't doing anything fishy, because uh, you should always be skeptical when people talk about extrapolations. Um, but uh, this is, we used the extreme extrapolation for every single value of the coupling. It's just a simple polynomial extrapolation um, inspired by something Sully et al. did in their paper, and it seemed to give uh, uh, good results. So the final plot I want to show, which I think is particularly interesting, is this really connects to string theory which, after all, is the subject of this conference. So here in these plots, we're fixing to a large value of n, n equals 10, and we're focusing on the strong coupling regime. So the x-axis is just looking at large values of g. And so we want to compare our non-perturbative bound, which we claim corresponds to n equals 4 superior mills, and we want to see, is this bound sensitive to stringy corrections? So are, are we actually sensitive to string theory, or are we only seeing supergravity? Because um, after all, you know, Rosselli saw supergravity already 15 years ago. Um, so let's see how we compare. Um, so, uh, first of all, um, we can consider the supergravity correction, which is green, and that's a horizontal line. Because remember, supergravity is not sensitive to the string coupling. And so the green line is like fairly close to the non-perturbative bound, um, a little bit closer for the scaling dimension than for the OP coefficient. Then we add in the first stringy correction, which goes like 1 over c to the 7 fourths. This is the r to the 4 correction. And that improves it, so it's a little bit closer now, although still a bit further away. But at least now it actually depends on the coupling. So you see it's kind of gradually going down. Then we add the next correction, this one loop correction, and that makes it even closer. So now we're actually very, very close to our non-perturbative bound. And this is particularly noticeable for the OPE coefficient, where this purple line is clearly much closer than the green line. Now, it's not exactly on the non-perturbative bound. After all, this is a very zoomed-in y-axis. And you know, uh, with the OPE coefficient, you know, we could use more convergence, and we could include maybe a few more strong coupling effects. But I think it's clear by comparing green to orange to purple and then the exact line that as we add in more of these stringy corrections, we are getting closer and closer to our non-perturbative solution. And so this uh, hopefully gives you some evidence that we are on the road to really being able to read off information about string theory from our non-perturbative solution. So in particular, the goal of this idea is that as we get more precision, uh, we will uh, be able to read off these 1 over c corrections. And so not only compare it to known corrections, but learn about new corrections, in particular corrections that are unprotected, for which this would be the only way of computing. Um, and so this would be a way of actually learning about non-perturbative string theory from um, conformal bootstrap. Um, OK, so um, in conclusion, um, the lessons of this talk is that, first of all, you need supersymmetric localization together with the bootstrap in order to get bootstrap bounds that are saturated by super Yang mills. And so it's not enough just to have crossing symmetry and unitarity. You really need localization if you want to study string theory. 
Um, that's something we've learned in the last few years. Um, the evidence that we're actually finding the physical theory is both at weak coupling and at strong coupling. So at weak coupling, we're able to compare to the single trace Konishi operator. At strong coupling, we're able to compare to the double trace operator. And in both cases, we find that these analytic predictions match our non-perturbative bound. Um, and then most interestingly, there's an intermediate regime where neither of these perturbative approximations work, and that's where you truly need a non-perturbative solution as we provide. And so this is where you go beyond, you know, the, oh, this, the trace link, you know, terminology, because it's neither single nor double. Um, okay, so uh, there's both near-term future directions and long-term future directions. So in the near term, we would like to get more accurate bounds um, and thereby be sensitive to more operators. Because of this entire talk, we only spoke about one operator, the lowest dimension spin zero operator. And so far, we are not able to get accurate results for higher operators, either higher twist or higher spin. Um, uh, but we believe that should be possible in the near future. Um, so in particular, there's various ways you could do this. Either you could put in more localization constraints coming from the squash sphere, or you could look, look at mixed correlators, which have access to other localization constraints, because there's infinite different mixed correlators that have newer localization constraints. Um, another thing which might be promising is in the bootstrap, usually it's good to mix all the relevant operators. Uh, so far, we've only looked at the stress tensor operator, which is dimension two. We could also do mixing with the Konishi, which we know is also relevant. And so uh, it's plausible that that will drastically improve the bounds. That was the case for the icing model. Um, hopefully, one of these methods will allow us to become sensitive to more operators, in particular, the second lowest twist spin zero. Because we expect that there are at most two relevant operators. Um, the one we've been looking at plus one more. Um, and so if we could just be sensitive to that other one, then we could impose that there's just two relevant operators. And that is how we would be able to get islands. So just as, in, just as in the icing model, you know, 10 years ago, they got both upper and lower bounds, thereby giving an island, thereby rigorously solving the theory. So far, we just have an upper bound, and we have lots of evidence that the physical theory is on this upper bound. To make it totally rigorous, though, we want to get a lower bound, and we hope to be able to do that once we are sensitive to more operators. Um, finally, this method is quite general. So it applies not just to N equals four spring mills, but you could do it to any theory in any dimension as long as you can do localization, which applies to all these different dimensions and amounts of supersymmetry. So we've done it for open string scattering, um, and we're currently working on doing it for ABGM theory. Uh, there were some previous papers, but uh, in those previous papers, we need to integrate constraints. And so we're hoping to have much more powerful results. Um, so it's nice to talk about the far future directions, though. Um, so like, what is the ultimate goal of this program? So like, if you could truly compute many, many different operators, not just the lowest few operators, but say the lowest 100 operators non-perturbatively for any value of n and tau, what would you learn about string theory? So what, what do you actually learn about string theory non-perturbatively? So one thing I think you could learn about is black holes. So on general grounds, we expect that black hole states um, should correspond to operators whose scaling dimension goes like n squared. Um, and so once n is large, you know, you should be able to interpret these things as black holes. Um, so there was already a very nice talk in this conference uh, by Chiming Chong talking about how for low values of n, for these 116 BPS black hole states, you can try to kind of construct them explicitly. So this, is, this would be kind of connected to that program, although our black hole states would be totally unprotected. So they're not the exact same states. Um, and so the goal is that if we could compute the 100 lowest operators, then we could study the statistics of these operators as we change the value of n and coupling. Because presumably, the statistics of operators should be very different in the weak coupling regime versus the strong coupling regime where we expect to have a gravity interpretation. And so we expect to see these statistics change and thereby learn something about quantum black holes and how they are created in the scattering of gravitons. So that's kind of a long-term goal of this program, uh, but it might be a few years. Uh, so in conclusion, if you're interested in these topics, I encourage you to attend this conference in Kyoto. Uh, we can also see the previous speaker. All right, that's it. <laughs> Questions? I have two questions that are probably related. One is whether you can extract anything from the extremal functional in this case. And, and the second part of the question is um, if you could say more about your comments about getting the second lowest twist operator. Because I would have, I would have thought that if you're already going to truncation some high order in truncation, um, so what? can you say more about why it's not sensitive to those yeah, operators? Yeah, okay. So, so indeed, both questions are related. So, when I said we're not sensitive to more operators, I was basically saying our functional is not precise enough to be, give, to be giving accurate results for these other operators. Now, why aren't we accurate enough? Well, first of all, if you talk about the icing model, even in the icing model, I think so far we're only sensitive to maybe the lowest few twist operators. You know, beyond that, it's just noise. Um, 
And so our case is even more challenging because the, like, the way we're sensitive to the coupling is via these integrated constraints. Um, and so the integrated constraints, the way we've been implementing them, um, you can study, say, for instance, the free theory, where you know everything. And in the free theory, 90% um, of the contribution to the integrated constraint is coming from the spin zero lowest twist operator. And only 10% is coming from everything else. And that's why it's very challenging to be sensitive to these other operators, both of higher spin and of higher twist. But I, I have some ideas of how we might be able to get, a, get around that. I don't know if they work yet. But like it's possible there might be other ways of implementing the integrated constraint where you could start becoming sensitive to other operators. So we go from being 90, 10% to maybe like 50%, 50%, you know, et cetera. Um, It seems that uh, this program depends on this assumption that uh, the bootstrap bounds are saturated by n equals 4, which seems like a very strong assumption, which in the Ising model eventually was kind of refuted. Well, okay, so it, it depends how precise you mean by saturated. So in the Ising model, when you say refuted, I think you're saying, did the, will the island shrink forever to a precise point? Yeah, so the answer is probably no. I mean, after all, the idea that just by looking at two correlation functions, you could solve somehow infinite data is perhaps asking too much. On the other hand, though, like, if you're an experimentalist, you know, you would say we probably solved the IC model because we've been computing the critical exponents for, like, 10 digits. And so it depends what you mean by solve. You know, similarly, in the context of n equals 4 super 8 mils, probably it is the case that our bounds are not exactly n equals 4 super 8 mils. But they're pretty damn close. I mean, you know, if you look at these bounds, you know, as you see, comparing the weak coupling and strong coupling, you know, it's a pretty good match, right? And, like, and this is only so far. We expect these bounds to get better and better and better as we input, you know, more mixed correlators, you know, uh, bigger truncation size, et cetera. Um, and so hopefully we will, the, you know, the bound will be close enough to n equals 4 square mills that we can extract the information we care about. Um, also, you know, eventually we'd like to make it more rigorous by getting also lower bounds. Because then we won't have to make any assumptions of saturating anything. We can just say, like, rigorously, n equals 4 is somewhere between these upper and lower bounds, you know, similar to the islands in the icing model. I have a related question. So, um, the, to, to extra, in order to extract observer like flat space uh, string asymmetrics, the bar for accuracy is very high. I was wondering how far are you away from getting the first unknown piece of type 2b string amplitude, which is the three loop d8 r to the fourth? Indeed, yeah, yeah. So, so that would probably be the first thing to try to extract. Um, and it's actually probably much easier to do that in the ABGM M theory dual. Um, so in general, the bootstrap works better in lower dimensions for reasons we don't fully understand. Um, and so we are currently bootstrapping uh, 3D ABGM theory, dual to um, M theory. Um, and in that case, our bounds are like magnitudes more accurate than what we have here. And so already I had a paper with Fernando Alde and Himanshu Raj from a couple years ago where we were comparing uh, the previous bootstrap bounds for ABGM to in the large N regime, to the analytic prediction. And so far, we were able to be sensitive not only to tree-level supergravity, which had been many years ago, but also to the one-loop correction. And so that was already a step in that direction. Um, what we're doing now, though, is like, you know, 100 times more accurate than what we did in that paper from a couple years ago, because we're now inputting these integrated constraints, which has drastically improved the accuracy. So I don't know for sure, but I think there is some hope that we might actually be able to read off D to date R to the 4, uh, starting with M theory and ABGM. I guess one worry one might have is kind of just computation you know, limits of uh, semi-definite programming. As the system gets bigger, uh, it becomes just computationally, uh, you know, much harder. And, uh, you know, in, because in, in principle, there are other alternative, like Hamilton truncation, and we know that it's not going to work very well just because computationally is too big. And... Yeah, I mean, yeah. So it's hard to say. I mean, uh, certainly I hope that the technical methods of bootstrap improve. I mean, to, just to give people perspective, you know, I like to compare to Lattice QCD. So Lattice QCD was invented in what, like the 60s or 70s? And like how many years was it until they were able to make useful predictions for the standard model? Maybe like 50 years or something. And so like numerical bootstrap, say, was only reinvented roughly like 10, 15 years ago. And like combining with localization was only invented like three years ago. And you know, and so like if you give us 50 years, you know, <laughs> hopefully we will be able to, you know, compare to real things. Speaking of 50 years, uh, say that you're forced to study the case where you cannot use localization. What input would you like to use to uh, do the numerical bootstrap? For example, let's think about some Clavon-Strasler, which, which is basically ADS 
uh, it still it gives you some ADS CFT, but uh, you cannot use a localization because you have minimal SUSE. Yeah, so without localization, you would just have crossing symmetry, um, which at least in n equals four is seemed to not be enough. So I mean, in particular, if you have some kind of, okay, so I guess if it's minimal supersymmetry, then I guess you might not have a coupling you're varying, so maybe that wouldn't be an issue. Mm -hmm. So if it is an isolated CFT, there is some hope that just bootstrap might be able to isolate it. Um, but the way I would maybe think about it is that the goal is really to use these most symmetric models, like 85 crosses five, to understand flat space strength theory. Mm -hmm. You know, and so if we could compute the effective field theory you know, in 10 dimensions to say like 10 orders, then you can compactify in any space you want and then learn about that compactification. So it's like the first step is understanding flat space and then, you know, from numerical bootstrap and the flat space limit. And then the second step would be doing your compactification of choice. And then you could even learn about compactifications with no supersymmetry. Mm -hmm. um. Can you comment on the physical interpretation of the growth of delta naught with G and Mills? Uh, well, I mean, the physical interpretation is that this is the strong coupling regime, where the lowest dimension operator is double traced, which we know from gravity. So this is like semi-classical gravity. Um, and then this is the weak coupling regime, which doesn't have any gravity interpretation. It's like the super stringy regime. Oh, uh, well, I mean, they both grow. Um, so I mean, but it's the same. I would use the same words. <laughs> Any other question? Excellent question. Okay, so so you you uh, you <laughs> you found our weak spot. Um, so actually, the bootstrap gets harder and harder as n gets bigger, uh, which I think is related to the fact that um, I mean it's all about the integrated constraints because of course crossing equations doesn't care about the value of n; they work for any value of n. It's integrated constraint which seems to get more challenging as n gets bigger. I, th I suspect that's probably because the value of the localization constraint is getting smaller as n gets bigger, um, and um, and so that's why we had to do this kind of extrapolation. Um, thankfully, we were able to go to big enough values of n such that we could see these large n features. Uh, but we will need you know, more convergence, more constraints to go to even bigger values of n. Um, but hopefully, we can go to big enough values of n to probe the large n regime, which I think we have, you know, because we're already matching to the strong coupling regime. And I should also comment that in the ABGM theory, where everything is way more converged, and that it's not as much of a problem there. So in fact, in ABIT, so it's basically, it's always a competition between how crossing is getting better versus how integrated constraints are getting worse. So crossing constraints actually get better as n gets bigger, uh, whereas integrated constraints seem to get worse. And so in 40, crossing is, is like converges so slowly that this is why it gets harder and harder as n gets bigger. In 3D, actually crossing converges so quickly that on the whole, everything improves as n gets bigger. And so that's why, you know, ABGM dual to M theory is probably the easier path forward. Yeah, so this question is not too directly related to the talk, but in, in recent years, people had made the progress for the ISIM model uh, using the fuzzy sphere uh, method to, to, to calculate the spectrum. Um, ha, have you thought or anyone thought about doing this uh, for, you know, n equal to four super young males, some discretization? Three dimensions. What? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, three dimensions. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. ABJM. Well, well, you, can, you can ask about ABJM. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, ABJM. Yeah, you can ask about ABJM. Um, okay, first of all, my understanding is that fuzzy sphere can't be directly applied to gauge theories. When they use it for gauge theories, they always have to have some other description that doesn't involve gauge fields. You know, so like, for instance, they'll try to use some kind of conjecture nonlinear sigma model. But like with ABGM, I don't think such a description exists. And so I think it'd be very challenging. Um, but I actually view that as a good thing, you know, because you might say that like, perhaps fuzzy sphere will replace the bootstrap for simple theories, you know, like ON vector models and whatnot, you know. And so the bootstrap will only survive as an application to holography, which will make the founder of bootstrap very happy. <laughs> Any further questions? I have one question, actually. So uh, you were talking about going to larger and larger n. I think uh, we know that n equal to infinity, the bulk theory has a black hole, which is a solution of Einstein's equations. Now, if we start talking about finite n, what would that configuration look like? Yeah, so that's a very interesting question. I don't really know the answer. So it's like, you know, as I said in the last slide, there's some expectation that for sufficiently large n and for sufficiently large dimension operators, these should somehow be related to black holes. 
Um, but like, I, that's the only comment I could really make. I mean, if, you know, the only other thing I could say is, you know, look at Chiming Chong's talk where he was trying to give a more detailed description of what these black hole states might look like. Uh, but that was using the Lagrangian, you know, from our, you know, abstract perspective of just some like list of numbers we're going to get hopefully one day, you know, you would have to learn something about the statistics of these operators. You mentioned about level non-crossing somewhere. Yeah. Maybe that's a signature. Yeah, yeah, okay, that is certainly something we should observe, yeah. So it's like that's, maybe that's kind of the next nice thing we'd like to learn. Once we're sensitive even to the second lowest operator, we will see very explicitly that they will be repulsing each other instead of crossing, as was observed in integrability. Uh, but yeah, I guess once you go to like the tenth lowest operator, there'll be all kinds of crazy repulsing going on, and like, yeah, they might indeed be related to them being black hole states. Thank you. Any no no one questions? asked about this picture. In, sorry, any other question? Well, so this is supposed to be, um, so, in the, so in the bootstrap, we always look for islands. And so when we apply bootstrap to holography, we're looking for a island of ADS. And so th that's what this is. So this is like the ship of bootstrap <laughs> looking for the island of, of ADS. <laughs> so on that happy note, let's thank Shai. <laughs>